Uh, so yeah, thanks a lot for agreeing to be on the panel. This turns out to be the last event in this uh, workshop. So I think it's a good way to uh, both conclude and, and look into the future. So I, let me ask one question first to all the panelists and then we open it up to, to the floor and, and to Zoom. So I was interesting to hear your opinion on, on what you think is the, the biggest achievement that, that machine learning has brought to the field. Uh, in the last few years, and in, in your opinion, right? You all work on slightly different stuff. So maybe if you want to start, Zach, and then we go from, from right to left. Convincing people to learn statistics. I think uh, if nothing else, it has made it cool to learn um, statistics and uncertainty propagation and all the things we sort of take for granted. And it was quite hard to convince people to do this a couple of years ago, 10 years ago. But now all of a sudden, everyone wants to learn. So I think that's already a big, a big help, even if we call it machine learning. I think uh, uh, the uh, impact of machine learning has been to encourage us to rethink a lot of the problems that we had before in the field, where a lot of manual parameterization or intuition has been sort of the norm, like in density functional theory, uh, in force fields, and uh, from you know experience, what you know computers have learned to interpret images and text uh, basically told us that. Uh, a lot of the manual work can be automated with some of these high dimensional models. And so now all of these approximations can be rethought and redone much more uh, accurately and perhaps automatically. So that sort of encourages a lot of people now to think that you know, all these difficult problems maybe can be solved. Yeah, I'm, I mean, together with these two things, I think adding um, the open openness of our data, it's also a very good point. I mean, we, we are really, able to do this thing because we are more transparent in the way we work and this is this is going to be a good for all of us um i don't really feel like i'm in a place to say uh <laughs> i feel like i'm more on the other side but what i think what i hope to continue uh see happening is that there is more sharing of code uh so that you know we can have quicker iteration and i think it's already happening I definitely don't want to say that the machine learning community has done that, but I think it's happening more and more. And uh, yeah, I think that would be better because we can, uh, you know, that's the only way we can make good progress. I think. Yeah, so I think as experimentalists, um, it gives us the opportunity to connect simulations and experiments. And uh, we have seen some of that. And I think, um, especially when there's not a direct connection between the experiment and the simulation, machine learning can help to bridge this gap. And this is very helpful, I think. Okay, thanks a lot for this uh, initial assessment. So maybe you take uh, questions from the audience, including uh, Zoom. So just raise your hand. You can ask a specific question to an individual, individual panelist or general. Andre, for example. Uh, okay, I have uh, two questions. Uh, first one, we've seen over this conference that everyone or lots of people are using much more and more complex models like the neural networks, having more and more layers, more complex architecture. So my thought is, because I'm not machine learnist yet, uh, are there a way how you can build something like uh, active learning AI that would architect this uh, machine learning model for you so it, they would be more efficient by themselves. So this is my first point. And then the second point is, uh, for example, in the catalysis, we've seen lots of new improvements going almost to the uh, close to the accuracy we want, but still uh, all these models are mostly in vacuum. So, but the real chemistry is going in ambient conditions or in water. Uh, what do you see how, uh, how the field will get over this another dimensionality of having the solution inside and how it will be in the future? Thank you. Let's take them maybe one at a time because they're quite different, the questions. So any thoughts from the panelists on, on using active learning to make models more compact? I think you might be talking about auto ML sort of methods like neural architecture search or other automated methods to find models that work. 
And I feel like that's already starting to happen a little bit and has especially happened in the image and language side, but I'm not aware of too many great tools for atomistic potentials, but it sort of feels like it has to happen unless everyone in this room becomes an expert at the latest and greatest every single time. And so maybe that's a solution. We all just get really good at it, or maybe someone comes up with a clever strategy to find the right representation or make these decisions automatically. Right? I don't know what'll work. Any, any other thoughts on this point? Rihanna? I think for the, for the say the image domain, it took quite a long time for the auto mail sort of like setting to become, or maybe still, it's still actually in the process of becoming actually useful. So I think we'll probably hit the point first where we have lots of people who have this magic, uh, you know, skills to figure out what's the right uh, architecture. And then maybe we'll get there. It's a super hard problem, but uh, yeah, it would of course be super, super useful. Then on the, the other aspect of com complexity, uh, I think that there's great opportunity what, what you mentioned by, by, by fusing computation and, uh, and experiment, right? And, and joint machine learning models. Any other thoughts? Uh, to me, that's, that's really the only way to, to go farther if we are able to integrate information that comes from different layers. So not only our traditional DFT or, or, or the energies that we can supply from, from the new potentials, but also try to encode some parts of information of in catalysis, very detailed characterization that we are having. And, uh, and, and, and characterization is very expensive. So you want to make the best use of it. And um, so I think that, um, Models with multiple layers will be needed in the future. Just maybe to comment on the uh, model complexity, and uh, I think it's a very, very important point that uh, uh, that it was raised. That uh, models are now getting very accurate for a lot of properties, uh, but uh, in practice they also get slow. So for for practical application in like molecular dynamics or design the materials, they need to be become much faster uh, and sort of consume less computational resources themselves for training and for inference. And so I think the next step in this whole game uh, is sparsification or reduction of model complexity, whether it can be done automatically or somehow by hand, I don't know. Uh, but uh, there's a lot of evidence that we are overdoing uh, a lot of things in uh, gigantic uh, neural networks or uh, maybe very complicated descriptors. And every time you try to simplify things, it still works. So there's a lot of opportunity in sparsifying and simplifying models to become much faster. And maybe they'll become also more transferable, who knows? But I think this is, this is where the field probably needs to go. Let's take a, another question from the floor. Thank you. Um, so my question was already, I mean, a little bit talked about in the first talk, but um, we also produce a lot of data, but I've been feeling we are quite, ineffective at sharing it actually with the community so maybe th some thoughts on how you think data and also maybe pre-trained models can be shared in um, the most effective way um, with the community so do you want to do you want to add anything uh, zach yeah, i mean you're I... already doing it too <laughs> <laughs> um We've certainly been generating data, but I think purposefully we haven't been working on the problem of how to share the data or um, include it with others. Because I look around and it's a monumental task that is very long-term and someone really needs a lot of resources. And in a lot of cases, I think the only way to get everyone to do it is to have it sort of be top down from funding agencies or someone else saying how to deposit stuff like what happened with the NIH and the Protein Data Bank and others, it, it really required the NIH to step in and say, everyone has to deposit in order to get everyone on the same page. And uh, just in my own group, I don't see any way that I could do anything on the scale of IOCMBD or NOMAD or these other centers. And so I feel like there's already people working on it. It's definitely a hard problem. I feel like it's getting better and hopefully it becomes easier, but uh, I don't think it's something that any one academic group can do. It, it, it feels like it has to be larger at a industrial or a national lab or um, world scale or something. Nas, do you have any thoughts on sharing experimental data? 
Yeah, sure. So I think uh, it's it's incredibly challenging task because there's uh, so many different groups, so many different approaches on how to, uh, yeah, like working approaches. And you have to come up probably with some sort of powerful ontologies and individual groups should have their own ontologies that are then merged into bigger ones. And so that gives you a layer that can, um, uh, yeah, in which way you could understand the data from different uh, sources, maybe. And um, this, this will be something that the community should work on in the next uh, years, probably. And Nuria, you're running a, a data platform too. Do you, have you thought about including yeah. models also? I mean, a little bit as, as both are saying, um, I think that the, from the funding mandates that we are all having, this is very difficult to allocate the money to do this thing in a systematic way that will be good for all the community. And the only actual way to do this is either enforce it as, as a, as a uh, proteins people did it uh, many, many years ago or help us in doing this. Even the data creation, I mean, many of you know that if you have data and you have a European project, you have to uh, project how you will be supporting this data for a little bit more than the extension of the project, but you cannot be covered by the project itself. So this generates lots of problems at different levels, not only the practical problem of fast sharing, it's also um, uh, the practical problem of finding the money to, uh, to maintain the databases alive. And, and this has to be syndicated in some way so that we can way, get our way forward. And I think that uh, researchers need to get um, recognized by the data that they are putting into databases, okay? This should be an achievement tool like a manuscript is or a paper is an achievement there should be, and the same goes for code. I mean, when I say data, I also say code. These parts are constituents to what we are doing and, and uh, you should get rewarded for this. Huh? Okay, let's take a question from Zoom, was it? Yes, okay. this is a question from the chat and it's asking, uh, what is your position on machine learning models for direct property prediction? and whether these can be joined with, uh, for example, machine learning potentials, since up to now they have been quite separate entities. Maybe uh, Boris, yeah. it very much depends on which property you're trying to predict. Uh, some properties are very smooth in structure space, for instance, if you're predicting energy, uh, if you're predicting something different, like for instance, uh, a kinetic property or uh, conductivity of things, very tiny changes in structure will produce very large changes in the property itself. So learning directly could be extremely difficult. And there you need a direct method for predicting this, either electronic transport or thermal or ionic transport, something like that. Uh, and that's where you know you have a machine learning model that accelerates the computation itself that gives you the property. Some uh, properties can just be directly probably uh, mapped from you know molecular structure to the uh, to the output, but it very much depends, I think. So. Uh, I don't think there's a single answer there. Uh, I also want to comment because if you have seen many of the predictions that we are trying to do or many of the objectives that we have been saying are related to thermodynamics. And still you have all the burning of the kinetics uh, that we are kind of having in the second layer uh, that we haven't really addressed or so not too much uh, uh, in many of the presentations that we have seen this day. Okay, a question from the floor. My question is about how the methods that are developed in this kind of community um, can be used by non-experts, so real experimentalists um, that, and how they, for example, how an experimental chemist would, for example, maybe use um, DFT. And my question specifically is how, how much you think that the fact that there seems to be a new, better method um, every um, very often how that kind of inhibits people adapting um, our, our models so the fact that there's a lot of change in, for example the leaderboards um, that we have um, and whether that's just kind of in the nature of that the field is still very much developing and we're kind of just waiting for the alpha fold that will blow everything out of the water um, and so that it makes it very clear for people to adapt 
these methods um, or how you see that general problem? I think there's more and more interest in how to do really high throughput and distributed inference across really wide spaces, right? We saw one talk today that was like a billion different crystal structures. That's amazing. I think that's going to get faster and faster. There are things that Google and Facebook and Amazon and others have already sort of set up, right? You don't need to do all that from scratch. Taking a PyTorch model and doing it highly parallel is something that should be possible. And when I think about what has happened on the DFT side, things like the materials project had the same problem where there's always a new recipe or functional or something. And they don't just have one entry, but it increments over time as they change their settings and update stuff. And so it's a hard problem, right? It took a lot of software engineers and others at the materials project to make it happen. But I think that's a really nice like demonstration of, of what we should have for these predictions of these models. I don't think it's gonna be experimentalists running models, having to learn simulations and everything else. I mean, that's just, it's just a lot to ask of someone, right? I mean, that's months or years of effort and I'm not sure that's the best use of the time, but we should have the outputs of these things be curated and put online so that anyone can see what is the next greatest model, say the energy of some surface or crystal or whatever is in the same way that we just go to the materials project and say, what is stable? Any other thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, also there is the issue of the cheaper a technology gets, um, the more people get attracted and the more um, black book it, it is, uh, the, more, the more you can get results that are not really helping you. And, and this is a danger. And this is also um, something that we need to be aware of that, uh, that, that the, um, there is a potential to use all these methodologies or many of them because they are far too cheap in the wrong way. But this has happened before. And, uh, and, and for the rest, for the, I mean, for the models, yeah, they will get a point that there will be a consolidation of a standard and maybe you will have changes in this standard. But if you think when the DFT codes were developed, the plain wave codes were developed, there were many initiatives. And at the end of the day, nowadays, there are a few codes that have survived. And I will expect that, that there will be some kind of reduction over time of all the things that we are exploring. Related to that, maybe a <clears throat> question from my side. So we've seen in, in many other presentations uh, sort of reference data sets that came from mostly image processing that helped a lot to, to get that technology um, progressed, right? Um, but it doesn't see, it seems to me that the material science community doesn't have such benchmark data sets and benchmark cases yet that are maybe understandable to a contributor without too much domain knowledge. So I think what you're building up, Zach, now is the first example of that with the challenges. And okay, you have your collaboration with Facebook that, that helps already, but do you see maybe in your respective fields, the emergence of such reference data sets and um, sort of reference challenges that people can contribute to? So I think this, there's already others in the community. Anubhav Jain comes to mind as having that map bench where you can go online and they have small data all the way up through materials project scale data for predicting properties and then track models over time. And so we go there quite often to see what, what the best for crystal structure energies and other properties is. Um, the other thing I would mention is the ML community has already addressed some of these challenges with sites like Papers with Code where the data sets and the models are being tracked over time. Uh, I don't think most of the material scientists have gonna, done a good job of getting their stuff into papers with code and tracked properly. So when you look at those things, they're pretty sparse on the leaderboards, but uh, that seems to be the approach that's working. I don't know if you have other thoughts. Yeah, I, I agree. Probably something like that. I, I think um, it just has to be a bit more, all the data just has to be shared a little bit better on similar platforms. So I think Papers with Code is a great way or doing it through these challenges. I, think that I mean, how many of you have gone to Papers with Code before? Right, I mean, a couple, right? Um, but I mean, these are the things that we should be thinking about, right? Like how do we really get it uh, easy to compare different data sets and models? But I think it's also quite, I mean, 
there's so many different tasks, right? You also mentioned, right, that it's quite important to explain to non-domain experts what the task is, right? But out of all the talks we've seen here, if you think about what type of data sets you need to solve all of your problems, that's actually quite a lot of different data sets, right? Um, so I think it's important to think about, I mean, if we just throw 10,000 data sets at people that are all really small, that nobody's gonna do it, right? So I think, you know, some organization also in that aspect is probably gonna be. Now, so what you see is the potential in sort of experimental data generation for, for such curated data sets for, for general machine learning improvement or, or even challenges, Kaggle or similar. Yeah, sure. So I've, I've actually seen a few um, examples where they uh, where the code and the data was shared or actually also in our papers, we shared the code and the data mostly. Um, but there's also um, efforts by the community to share data sets for benchmarking. These are mostly relatively small data sets. But um, once you make it public, then people could add to it and also refine the code. And then something like this could evolve. And I think it will evolve in the future. Yeah. Do we have questions from the floor or from Zoom? Mm, I think it, my question is more of a bit more general. So for if you think about it, at the beginning of deep learning, all of the hype and all of the young students who were, who were super excited to do deep learning, they were quite motivated by the examples, right? Like, for example, if you have images, you can do generate new, I don't know, cat images or whatever. So, and then this still pub came about, which started talking about, oh, how does the model work? And then a lot of visualizations around what, what you can tweak and then how things work. So I, I feel material sciences is uh, as a field. So I come from computer science and to me, it's quite interesting, like the kind of work that's happening. But I also feel this, uh, if I now try to talk to my computer science uh, colleagues, it's really hard to explain to them what exactly is going on. And I feel there needs to be some sort of, um, I don't know, an outreach program, which kind of explains like the kind of, interesting problems that we are solving here in terms of like layman's languages. So do you feel there's a, maybe a gap? I, I mean, of course, now we, this is completely devoid of what we are doing here, like machine learning for materials. But then I think there's a need for a general outreach kind of a task that I think we as material, machine learning for material science, scientists could do in terms of showing applications of uh, what's happening and then generate more interest among, I don't, I don't know, lay people. And then, then that in combination with the data sets that we just spoke about, it will just, I think, I, I think I feel that's kind of missing. And then what are your thoughts and opinions on that? I'll comment on that. You want to solve climate change? You need materials. You want to solve the problems that we are having with plastics? We need materials. You need to solve the energy harvesting problem? We need materials. You need to store hydrogen efficiently. You need materials. Just a few of them. I, I think that's great, but that's, I think a machine learning person needs slightly more concrete information than we need material. Yeah, well, <laughs> no, but no, it is kind of the education, I think that that is important, right? So if, if you, as a machine learning person, you enter sort of like a new field and you're like, oh my God, this looks so scary. I don't understand any of the nomenclature. I have no idea what you're talking about. It's like, okay, I'm just gonna, we, there's many workshops, right? In NURBS uh, or in ICML or ICLR for uh, ML for uh, science. But they're pretty, as much as we try, they're still quite sometimes inaccessible for people with no domain knowledge at all, right? So slightly clear uh, translation into a language that you know, machine learning practitioners can understand, like, this is my output, this is my input of my model, this is what I want to predict, and this is important. Uh, I think those type of, I think sometimes these things could be improved, because, for instance, if I, I can, I can write maybe a nice paper about a generative model of a material, and I'll probably, you know, write something that I think is great, and then you'll look at me and like, that's totally useless, what did you do, right? And so I think these type of discussions, we should probably have a bit more. Absolutely, it was just uh, 
a flavor of a few things that uh, if you are interested. I would also go one beyond that. Um, I mean, getting collaborators interested in your problems is, is an old problem, right? I mean, we've all struggled with this, right? It's not just it's not just getting ML people interested in our problems, it's getting physicists or mathematicians or statisticians or whoever else. And a little bit of it is motivation. Climate change is a good one. And I think that's the best one to hook people with because there's obviously a lot of targets and needs and ESG targets and other things that make these companies very motivated to solve these problems. But it also needs to be an interesting problem and it needs to be a hard problem. And it needs to be something that they agree is actually hard on their side and cool and fun and pushes the boundary somehow. And so my impression for one of the reasons why so many companies are interested in the space right now of all the times that this could have happened is large graph models are quite interesting and hard and are moving very quickly. And if we said that the only thing that needed to happen was another image recognition problem to solve climate change, there would be some people interested in that, but I don't think we would have the same sort of engagement. So it's on us, I think, often to do the translation and find problems that are hard and interesting. And sometimes people will just look at you and say, that's um, something I could solve, but it's not actually a hard problem. And you just have to live with that. And that's okay. You go and talk to other people or you just download the codes or the reference methods or just do the standard approach. But not, not all the time is there gonna be the spark that says, the ML people or math people or whatever have to work with you and have to have to help you on your problem. And that's okay. Thank you. So we're already coming to the end of this panel discussion. It's uh, relatively short today, but I wanted to ask you each one of you one concluding question. So we, we started off with the, the achievements of machine learning. And then now I'd like to ask you about what you think is the, the largest challenge that we're currently still facing. Just one. I mean, I know there are many. Uh, in, in your specific area that, that you're working in. So let's start at the other end. So Lars, if you wanna. Yeah, so maybe from the experimental side, it's uh, if you do machine learning, you often need input and output values. And so in that case, it means that you have to have some final conclusion about your results. And often in experimental, if you look at experimental data, this is subject to, um, yeah, personal understanding of the data and uh, maybe also the field of the person. And so there's not always the one final conclusion, which is also maybe an issue with benchmarks and experimental data sets. If uh, two people perform a face classification, they could come up with different results, basically. And this might be an issue uh, and a challenge. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Rianne? Yeah, so I think the one thing that I, I'm worried about is I think a little bit related to what you've talked about also, is that we're gonna do machine learning on synthetic data only. And then for instance, we're going to do, oh yeah, great. We managed to fit the DFT functional, but actually the DFT functional isn't really that good in the first place, right? And then I feel like we haven't really done anything useful. So I think it's still pretty hard to integrate with experimental data, but we should probably yeah. keep a close on that. As a big challenge, I think, training and training for everybody and uh, make sure that we can have careers for uh, for uh, different people uh, with different backgrounds that um, that provide different um, different contributions to the chain chain value uh, in science I mean if we are if we are just thinking about the academia uh, we are we are really missing that we don't have a clear career paths for profiles that are mixed. Uh, we are trying hard. <laughs> so, but, uh, but it will be very important that, that everybody understands the role of different people that it's, uh, that it's in a scientific team, um, adding all this complexity because our problems are highly complex. So we will need people that, that, that can um, understand and translate them in, in very different manners. Boris? I think the biggest uh, challenge probably is formulating problems that uh, can then be solved with machine learning. I mean, we have techniques uh, in the machine learning world, but using them uh, in an intelligent way for uh, predicting properties is, uh, I mean, you could do brute force kind of things, uh, let's say uh, 
some problems are very data driven. Like you, you start with a structure, you try to predict some property. Um, but oftentimes these uh, problems can benefit from incorporating a lot of physical priors or exact constraints or symmetries. Uh, that clearly makes a lot of uh, models much more efficient and uh, more interpretable. So the, the question is how to sort of transform your problem that you're trying to solve uh, in such a way that you know you can intelligent have line of machine learning algorithms. For instance, one of the biggest problems I think is, for instance, describing quantum states like you know, density functional theory is not good, right? So we can definitely make progress in making it better. How do you learn uh, a density functional? Uh, how do you input uh, into the learning algorithm, for instance, all the exact constraints that we know from fundamental physics or in force fields? How do you incorporate exact symmetries of 3D space in which molecules and materials live so that your force fields are not uh, uh, just brute force? And um, So these kind of problems like you know, connecting what we know in physics and chemistry with machine learning, I think is where a lot of work needs to be done. I think if we want these methods to have an impact, the models also have to be robust. Robust to different structures, robust to different inputs, robust to all the different things we ask of them. And uh, I feel like in my own group, we've developed tons of tools where it's easy to have a demonstration system and the results are good and you go ahead and publish, but then you put it into practice and there's 3% or 5% or 10% of edge cases that, that crop up and, and you have to hammer them down and figure it out, but it's, it's really hard to do. And I think that's gonna become more of a problem. And I'm coming at this also from a chemical engineering background where there's been this, um, uh, this community of people doing systems engineering and optimization and control, where if you wanna control action for a plant, um, a chemical plant that is processing tons and tons of material that is flammable and destructive and everything, you can't have a control action that could potentially blow the plant up. And uh, we don't have quite those same problems with DFT, right? No one is gonna die if our DFT simulation goes off course and that's, that's good. <laughs> um, but uh, robust optimization and robust control and all these other things are, are very established. And I think we need to learn some of these things from other fields because it's, it's really hard to get something that works all the time where someone actually trusts it and says, this is as good as a student doing it by hand. Okay, thank you for your insight and for agreeing to be on the panel. So this concludes the panel discussion now, and uh, I hand over to my fellow organizers for the concluding remarks. <laughs>